Ever feel like you're walking through a maze blindfolded when it comes to all the financial jargon out there? It can definitely feel that way, especially when everyone's promising you the moon and back with their investment strategies. That's why today we're doing a deep dive into something called backtesting. Is it the magic crystal ball everyone claims it to be or just another Wall Street illusion? Let's just say it's a bit more complicated than that. Think of it less like a crystal ball and more like a recipe you're testing out in the kitchen. Okay, I can work with that analogy. At its core, backtesting is all about using historical data, past market information, to see if an investment strategy would have worked. So kind of like trying to recreate your grandma's famous cookies, but with stock prices instead of flour and sugar. Exactly. You're trying to see if following a certain set of rules based on past market trends would have led to, hopefully, delicious returns. Sign me up for those cookie returns. But if it were that simple, wouldn't everyone be a stock market millionaire by now? Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more Quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow Quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. And now, back to the episode. If only it were that easy. You see, just like with a recipe, there are different ways to test an investment strategy, each with its own set of pros and cons. So it's not as simple as just plugging in some numbers and voila, instant market beating returns. Not quite. Let's start with the most basic type. Walk forward testing. Imagine following your grandma's cookie recipe to the letter just once. Okay, picture that one batch, one oven, one shot at cookie glory. And let's say they turn out amazing. Does that automatically make you a master baker? Guaranteed to replicate those results every single time. Hmm. I can see where you're going with this. One batch of perfect cookies doesn't necessarily mean I've cracked the baking code for life. There could have been other factors at play, right? Like my oven was having a good day, or maybe I unknowingly used extra chocolate chips. Exactly. And that's the inherent risk with walk-forward backtesting. You're only looking at one specific historical path, one set of market conditions. What worked during a booming market might fall flat during a downturn. So how do we account for those what-if scenarios? Do we just bake a million batches of cookies, each time slightly tweaking the recipe? You're on the right track. That's where resampling comes in. Instead of one batch of cookies, we're baking multiple batches, each time slightly changing the starting point in the recipe. So instead of just one historical path, we're testing the recipe, or in this case, the investment strategy, across different starting points in the market data. Exactly. This helps us see how the strategy would have performed under various conditions, not just one isolated instance. Okay, that makes sense. So we're essentially stress testing the recipe to see if it holds up under different circumstances. Does that mean resampling is the holy grail of backtesting? Have we finally cracked the code? It's definitely a step in the right direction. But remember, we're still relying on historical data. Markets are constantly evolving. New ingredients are being added to the mix all the time. What worked in the past might not work in the future. All right, so no guarantees then. But you mentioned something earlier about Monte Carlo simulations. That sounds pretty high tech. Where do those fit into all of this? Monte Carlo simulations are like the next level up in our baking analogy. Imagine building a virtual kitchen in your computer, a simulator that lets you control every single variable, oven temperature, ingredient quality, even the humidity in the air. That's some serious baking technology. I can barely keep track of what's in my pantry, let alone create a virtual one. Well, with Monte Carlo, we're essentially building a stock market simulator. We're factoring in all sorts of variables, economic data, interest rates, even things like investor behavior. So it's like having a team of analysts working around the clock, crunching numbers, running endless simulations, trying to predict every possible outcome. In a way, yes. These simulations can run thousands, even millions of times each time with slightly different parameters. That sounds incredibly powerful. Is this the ultimate answer we've been searching for? Can Monte Carlo simulations predict the future of the stock market with certainty? They're definitely a powerful tool, but even Monte Carlo simulations have their limitations. You see, building a reliable market simulator requires a deep understanding of what drives market movements. So it's not as simple as just plugging in some numbers and letting the computer spit out the answer. There's still an element of human judgment involved. Precisely. 
and as we'll see in the next part of our deep dive. Understanding these nuances is crucial if you're going to rely on backtesting to make informed investment decisions. Okay, so we've explored the different flavors of backtesting, from the simple walk forward to the super-powered Monte Carlo simulations. But it sounds like there's a dark side to all of this, right? There are definitely some potential pitfalls to be aware of. Even with the best intentions, backtesting can be misleading. It's kind of like judging a chef solely on their best-selling dishes. Without knowing about all the kitchen nightmares that never made it onto the menu? Precisely. That's a great example of survivorship bias. You're only looking at the successes, the strategies that survived, the funds that didn't go bust. But what about all the failures? Those could hold valuable lessons, too. So it's like only reading the glowing five-star reviews online and ignoring all the cautionary tales hidden within the one-star reviews. You're missing out on valuable information. Exactly. And speaking of missing information, let's talk about another common pitfall. Using data that doesn't reflect what was actually known at the time, it's like using yesterday's weather report to decide if you need an umbrella today. Or worse, using a map with outdated traffic information. You might end up stuck in a jam you never saw coming. That's a great analogy. In backtesting, we call this point-in-time data. It's crucial to make sure the data we're using aligns with the actual information that was available to investors at that specific moment. So no peeking into the future, even accidentally. We need to make sure our back tests are using the same information that was available to decision makers at the time. Absolutely. And here's another trap that often catches people off guard. Outliers. Outliers. Are we talking about those two good to be true moments that make a strategy seem invincible? Exactly. Those rare events, those statistical anomalies that can skew your perception of how well a strategy would have actually performed. So it's like judging a baseball player's entire career based on one incredible game where they hit three home runs. It's impressive, sure. But is it a true reflection of their overall skill level? You nailed it. That's why it's so important to look beyond those attention-grabbing outliers and focus on the bigger picture. How consistent is the strategy over time? How does it perform across different market conditions? So we need to see the full picture, the good, the bad, and the ugly, before we get too excited about a back-tested strategy. Precisely. Speaking of seeing the full picture, let's talk about data representativeness. Is that about making sure we're not just cherry-picking data that fits our narrative? Exactly. We need to make sure our data covers a wide range of market conditions. Bull markets, bear markets, periods of high volatility, periods of calm, the whole shebang. So just like we wouldn't judge a chef solely on their desserts, we need to see how a strategy performs across different market environments. Makes sense. But there's something else we need to watch out for, right? Something called data snooping. Ah, data snooping. It's a sneaky one, that's for sure. Imagine trying on hundreds of outfits, rejecting one after another, until you finally find one that looks absolutely amazing on you. And then posting that perfect photo on social media, making it seem like you just effortlessly pulled that outfit together. Exactly. But what you're not showing are all the other outfits, the ones that didn't make the cut. With data snooping, instead of outfits, we're talking about back tests. So instead of trying on different outfits, we're running countless back tests, tweaking parameters, trying different data sets until we stumble upon that perfect result. Exactly. And here's the kicker. Every time you run a new back test, you increase the odds of finding something that looks statistically significant, even if it's just due to random chance. So we could be fooled into thinking we've discovered a winning strategy when in reality, it's just a matter of playing the odds long enough. Precisely. That's why it's crucial to be aware of the multiple testing problem. The more back tests you run, the more likely you are to find a false positive. It's a bit like flipping a coin enough times. Eventually, you're bound to get a long streak of heads, even though the odds are still 50-50. So how do we avoid falling into this trap? How do we separate genuine insights from statistical flukes? That's where a solid understanding of statistical significance comes in handy. We need to adjust our expectations based on the number of tests run, use rigorous statistical techniques, and be honest with ourselves about the possibility of finding false positives. So it's not enough to just look at the results of a back test in isolation. We need to understand the context, the number of trials run, and the statistical robustness of the findings. Absolutely. And while we're on the topic of potential pitfalls, let's talk about look-ahead bias. This happens when we accidentally use information in our back test that wasn't actually available at the time. So like using tomorrow's newspaper to predict today's stock market. You got it. It can be subtle, like using a company's earnings announcement that happened after the date you're backtesting on. 
So we need to be extra vigilant about the timing of information, making sure we're not inadvertently giving our strategies an unfair advantage. Precisely. And speaking of unfair advantages, let's not forget about real-world constraints. Ah, right. Backtesting in a vacuum is one thing, but actually executing trades in the wild, wild west of the stock market is a whole other ballgame. You said it. Things like transaction costs, those pesky fees we pay every time we buy or sell, can eat into our profits. And we can't forget about things like slippage and liquidity, especially when dealing with larger orders that might not get filled at the price we want. Those are all crucial factors to consider. Ignoring them is like planning a road trip without factoring in gas prices, tolls, or the possibility of traffic jams. You might reach your destination eventually, but it's going to cost you a lot more than you anticipated. So how do we make sure our back tests are grounded in reality? By being meticulous about incorporating these real-world constraints into our models, we need to factor in trading costs, account for slippage, and be realistic about how much liquidity we can expect. Remember, a backtest is only as good as the assumptions it's built on. So we've cooked up our backtesting recipe, avoided all the data pitfalls, and now we're ready to feast on those market-beating returns. But how do we measure success in this backtesting banquet? What's the main course metric we should be looking at? One of the most common metrics you'll come across is the Sharpe ratio. Think of it like a measure of risk-adjusted return, kind of like a report card for how much return you're getting for the amount of risk you're taking on. Generally speaking, higher is better. So a higher Sharpe ratio means a tastier, more satisfying return relative to the risk. But there's a catch, isn't there? There always seems to be a catch with backtesting. You're right to be cautious. The Sharpe ratio can be a bit deceiving if you don't account for something called a uh, Multiple testing. Remember how we talked about data snooping earlier? Yeah, like trying on a million outfits until you find the one that looks absolutely perfect on you, even if it's not really your style. Exactly. Multiple testing is kind of like that. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying on different outfits, though, we're running tons of different back tests, each with slight tweaks here and there. So we're basically playing the odds, running enough back tests until we stumble upon that elusive high sharp ratio, even if it's just a statistical fluke. You hit the nail on the head. And that's where the false strategy theorem comes in. This little theorem basically says that even totally random strategies, those with absolutely no real edge, can appear successful if you back test them enough times. So even a broken clock is right twice a day, as they say. Or, in this case, even a random strategy can look like a golden ticket if you backtest it enough times. Exactly. That's why it's so crucial not to get blinded by that shiny sharp ratio. We need to consider the context. How many backtests were run before landing on that magical number? What were the parameters? Did they torture the data until it confessed? So transparency is key. Don't be afraid to ask questions and dig a little deeper, especially when a strategy seems too good to be true. Absolutely. At the end of the day, backtesting is just a tool, and like any tool, it can be used effectively or ineffectively. It's up to us to use it wisely, be aware of its limitations, and not get swept away by those seductive high-sharp ratios. It sounds like a healthy dose of skepticism is crucial in the world of backtesting. We can't just blindly trust the numbers. We need to understand the story behind them. Couldn't have said it better myself. Backtesting can be incredibly valuable, but it's not a crystal ball. We need to use it in conjunction with other tools and approaches, always remembering that the future is inherently uncertain. No backtest can perfectly predict what tomorrow holds. This has been an incredible journey into the world of backtesting. We've learned about its power, its pitfalls, and the importance of staying informed and vigilant. We hope you've enjoyed this deep dive as much as we have. Until next time, happy investing.